Hi everyone and welcome to a Yahoo special presentation, Pride Evolution. I'm Kelly Matusik. Over the course of the next hour, we'll be hearing from some prominent voices in the LGBTQ plus community who will not only be talking about how Pride has seen an evolution over the years, but also how the present is impacting future generations. We'll be hearing from comedians, Olympic athletes, doctors, leaders of organizations, and everyone in between to center the LGBTQ plus community and to shed light on their stories. First, we'll be talking about allyship, something that has become a bit of a buzzword over the last year with more and more public figures and corporations showing support during Pride Month. To speak more on this, I'm joined by comedian, actor, and activist Margaret Cho, president and CEO of GLAAD, Sarah Kate Ellis, president of the Human Rights Campaign, Alfonso David, and former WWE wrestler, Gabby Tuft. First, I want to start with Sarah Kate Ellis and Alfonso David. You both lead organizations that are vital to the progression of LGBTQ rights. How would you define the act of real allyship? And what are some ways that an ally can show support in their everyday lives? Um, well, I think, thank you for having me. Happy Pride, everyone. Happy Pride. Uh, allyship is critical and essential to our movement. We can't do it without our allies. And what I ask is that allies come out not only during Pride, but every other month of the year. And I think allies can do small acts and large acts, everything from protesting and marching to stopping bullying online or calling people out or sharing their stories, especially in rooms that we might not be in as LGBTQ people, where there might be disparaging discussions happening. So they have a real opportunity to change hearts and minds. So allyship, from my perspective, needs to be a year round event. It's not just during pride. And I think when we look at corporations, um, we're doing a program right now called Project Visibility, which is having companies sign up to include LGBTQ in their advertising. So when you are participating as a corporate, you must not only market to our community, you must join our movement and support us at every turn that is supporting or standing up against anti-LGBTQ legislation to making sure that we're involved and included in front of the camera and behind the camera on your advertising campaigns. So it's a big, it's a 360 commitment to our community. I would say that allies are also, uh, I agree, a critical part of the LGBTQ rights movement and have been for decades. Our community right now is facing multiple threats across the country. And I think we need more advocates for equality than ever before. I would suggest that as we think about allyship, we also think about allyship through the lens of advocacy because allies are critically important, but without action, it's very difficult to advance change. So we need allies to think of themselves as advocates. We all benefit when people are treated equally and we all have to be invested in supporting equality. At its core, I believe that advocacy through allyship really liberates people from their dependence on privileges that they rely on. And those privileges in some cases further subjugate marginalized communities. We know that many businesses, labor organizations, other advocacy organizations that are not LGBTQ actually help support the LGBTQ civil rights movement. And creating that shared community, I believe, is a testament to the fight that we are engaged in now. And this fight I call for liberation, that none of us are really free until all of us are free. And I hope that we can take that message forward during this month of pride. And creating a community is so important. Margaret, many folks who identify as bisexual or pansexual sometimes feel like they don't have allies within the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I've experienced it myself. You know, what was your experience with coming out? And did you ever feel like you didn't have allies, like you were an outsider or maybe just not queer enough? I definitely still feel like an outsider in a lot of ways within the queer community. But at the same time, I understand because bisexuality, which I also don't agree in the word bisexuality because it seems to say that there's only two genders whereas i believe gender is infinite but i'll use the term just because it's something that has been used but i think that um we are always used as an excuse when people come out first time they come out they say they're bisexual in order to sort of soften the blow of their gayness which is a really weird idea of thinking about like being bisexual is like a connecting flight like we're charlotte or dallas fort worth or atlanta 
but we're more than that. We're an actual place to be. We are a destination. And uh, I came out as a lesbian first. I had long uh, denim shorts, knee length shorts, and a messenger bag, and a bike chain, and big boots, and I wouldn't stop coming out. And then people were like, could you please stop coming out? And then I re realized that uh, I actually wanted to have more or different experiences. So then I came, came out as straight and then I came out as bi. So now I'm a fruit. I love that you're a fruit. I think we need more I fruits. love fruit. Uh, yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, and Gabby, I mean, as the first WDB wrestler to come out as transgender, you've been openly public about your process through your digital Gabby transformation project. Why have you been so open about your transition and have your fans and your family been supportive throughout? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, fans and family completely supportive from the start. Uh, as far as why I have been so open, there was so much emotional trauma I went through. I faced a massive fear um, of coming out. I was, my, my business Body Spartan is 90% male demographic and I was the, what you would think of like the epitome of the alpha male when I was male. And so to go from one end of the spectrum to the soft, delicate female, I was so scared I was gonna lose everything. My family, my wife, my daughter, my friend, they're all gonna reject me that I had many, many, many dark nights where I contemplated suicide. And I was very, very close to, to pulling the trigger many times. And so knowing what I went through and knowing that there are other people out there, whether you're transgender, male or female or somewhere in between, I don't ever want anyone to have to deal with that. We should live in a society where instead of a transgender person being fearful of coming out, it should be celebrated. Thank you for sharing that with us. I know that that means a lot to you and, and really like we appreciate you being here right now and sharing your story. Um, of course. You know, Sarah, Kate and Alfonso, you know, with all the strides the community has made in the last 50 years, where do you see the future of this active allyship heading? Well, I think that as we think about allyship in the future, I hope that people can see themselves in our community. Um, LGBTQ people are looking for the same things as everyone else. We're looking to be treated equally. We're looking to be treated with dignity. We're looking to be treated with respect. And the concepts and the principles of equality and liberation should be one that we all share. So I hope that as we think about allyship in the future, more and more and more people will see that they have a vested interest and arguably a responsibility to engage in this fight with us. Because if we're not treated equally, then arguably they're not being treated equally. And this landscape that we live in that we call our democracy is not really going to be fully realized until all of us are treated equally. So as we move forward, I hope that we are seeing more and more allies taking on the role of being advocates for change and advocates for equality. Yeah, and I think to add to that, when we look at the future, what I see is that we have a very young population that is more and more identifying as LGBTQ, right? So the recent Gallup poll that just came out saw a 20 percent increase in 18 to 24 year olds identifying as LGBT. 16 percent of that population identifies as LGBT. And if you add the Q to that, that number practically doubles. So I think that what we're seeing is a new generation coming up where it is going to be an imperative to be an ally because there are going to be so many of them. And 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 back to Margaret's point, which is the different flavors of our community and how we identify and how the spectrum is moving and ebbing and flowing. And it's so important that we are, you know, there are so many 18 to 24 year olds that are coming out as transgender, that are coming out as gender non-binary. And those, those identities are in the crosshairs right now. We're seeing it legislatively, right? The attacks that we're seeing on the trans community on a daily basis, both physically and policy-wise. And so we need allies right now to galvanize. And another thing, there are so many allies, and I think what they think, I know what they think because we have the research, 90% of Americans 
think that we are, we have just as equal rights as everybody else. And when, but we know we don't, and I know we'll talk about it in a little while, but the Equality Act is a critical piece of legislation that will get us to parity with the rest of the community, with the rest of society. And I think it's really important that we see allies educate themselves on it and stand up and call their senators about it. Definitely. And when we come back, we'll continue our conversation and talk more about how allyship and visibility work hand in hand. You might have noticed a little bit of a different lineup. This is a new combination for us and a new time. This week, we're going to be kicking off some changes in our programming. We're in a critical period right now with record cases. We want public health measures to be the gateway to safely and prudently opening up the economy again. My advice to any entrepreneur out there is you got to pivot. Man. In this land of opportunity, anything is possible. It all comes down to business economics and safety. We can do this. I'm absolutely convinced. We're here in Jackson Hole sitting down with Kansas City Fed President Esther George. So I think the Federal Reserve's commitment has been to being as transparent as they can. The low inflation is a real challenge for us in, as central bankers. It shows that we're data dependent and it shows that we're sensitive to what's going on in the, in the macroeconomic environment. We certainly should be able to communicate uh, what our policy is. Your family will fall in love with The Croods, A New Age. 95% on Rotten Tomatoes. This is amazing. What do we do? What do we say to each other? What's happening to our voices? Where are our voices getting so high? It's perfect family fun. You see that wall? Yeah. You want to jump it? Yeah. Woo! The Croods, A New Age. Rent or own the latest movies with Verizon Fios On Demand. I can save today, but you can save the world. One day, you'll become all that you dream of and more. And everything will be different. This world is not ready for all that you will do. The world needs you. Wonder Woman 1984. Rent or own the latest movies with Verizon Fios On Demand. Welcome back to Pride Evolution. I'm Kelly Matusik. Whether it's waving a pride flag, adding pronouns to email signatures and social media accounts, or showing support for LGBTQ plus causes, visibility has become much more prevalent in mainstream culture. In the last year alone, we've seen public figures come out as LGBTQ plus, as non-binary or transgender, including Elliot Page, Demi Lovato, and Lil Nas X. And studies have also shown that a record number of US adults 5.6% and 1 in 6 Gen Z adults now identify as LGBTQ+. Margaret, I want to start with you. From writing your own comedy specials to hosting your podcast, The Margaret Show, you've used those opportunities to speak on your identity and your experiences. Can you tell us more about why you've taken an active stance against being silent or being invisible and how you've done that? Well, this year would mark my 42nd Gay Pride, I think, since 1978, I've been going, so something like that, something like that. But it's really incredible to uh, be able to witness all of um, the way that we have emerged as a strong and visible community and all the way that we've changed in that, in that process. And um, being an Asian American, being a feminist, being queer, these things are the way that I define myself, but also I have been caused so much pain by all these separate identities for different reasons. And so I want people to be able to feel like they're being seen, they're being heard and reflected back in the work that I do. And so it's very important for me to talk about all of my experiences with a sense of humor, with a sense of um, truth and honesty, this candid quality that doesn't veil any of these things, that all of these aspects of my identity don't have to be um, othered. They're not othered within me. They are me. Yes, exactly. And Gabby, when you came out, you said, this is a side of me that has hidden in the shadows, afraid and fearful of what the world would think. Now that you're fully out and fully yourself, 
How has that visibility changed your view on life and the future? Oh my gosh, yeah. It, it felt like there was always something that was being quelled, like a, a spirit deep within me that was being quelled. But now that I'm out, I have never felt so free my entire life. My entire outlook has changed. I'm internally happy and it just, it glows. It comes through everything I do, everything I say, and it gives me hope for the future. Knowing that if someone in my position that went through, like I said earlier, so many dark nights, if I can come through and have this incredible life that I have now where my wife loves me for who I am, and she's the same woman that loved me when I was a man. My daughter fully accepts me and she supports me and all of her friends support me. My neighbors, they all brought flowers and cards over the day I came out in the public eye. Um, and these are people that that you wouldn't think. I live in Texas in, in an area outside of Austin that's very, very conservative. And it just gives me so much hope to see all these people come and accept me. Like my entire neighborhood, they are amazing. Like my daughter goes and plays with the kids. They come over here and it's as if nothing has changed. I, I have this saying where the shell may change, but the soul remains the same. And that's the hope that I have for the future, that people that are just becoming aware of the transgender community and the LGBTQ community, there's a lot of fear that's involved sometimes. And I really, really think that awareness is key, especially for the future and for our younger generations, that if we are presented in a light where this is us, we want to live our lives, we want to be happy, we're not here to cause fear or harm to anyone, we're here just to integrate and live a normal life. If we can instill that in the younger generation, I really feel like there is going to be massive, massive hope for the future. Margaret and Gabby both talked about visibility, but um, Alfonso, in the last few years, the pride flag has actually been revised a little. Um, many LGBTQ plus people have started using a new pride flag that's inclusive to trans folks and the BIPOC community, some calling it the progress flag. What is the significance of this and how does this tie into the history of pride? Well, this goes to the core of intersectionality. Uh, our movement, the LGBTQ rights movement was founded by black and brown transgender women. Uh, who fought against police brutality, both in California and in New York. So as we think about our history, we have to celebrate our history, learn from it, and help that history inform the present. When we're talking about new flags that reflect all of our identities to so what Margaret was talking about, it is so key. I don't frankly believe that we can achieve equality and liberation in this country without recognizing all of the intersections of our, our identity. I'm black, I'm gay, and I'm an immigrant. And I would have to believe that I'm a part of a community that celebrates all of those identities and prioritizes those identities as we think about celebrating pride and we think about advancing LGBTQ rights generally. So I'm, I'm, it's heartwarming to see the recognition of black and brown people who have been so instrumental in advancing this movement, but in many cases have been either disregarded or ignored um, in terms of our history books. And so it's important now as we celebrate pride and we modernize pride that we include those voices and those images into the LGBTQ tapestry. Definitely. And next, Alfonso and Sarah Kate will stick around as we talk more about the increase of LGBTQ plus visibility in the workplace and in politics and how this representation can create lasting change for the community. Who are these vagabonds and what have they done with my children? I'm Peter Pan. Oh! from Wonderland. We can all use a little extra courage now and then. It's not time to grow up. Come away, rated PG. Rent or own the latest movies with Verizon Fios On Demand. We are trying to move toward this beautiful vision of justice together. Be unapologetic of the impact and the power that you have. I don't want to teach women how to cook. I don't want to teach women how to bake. I want to teach them how to lead. It's going to take all of it, everything in you, 
to keep going. Hey people, we are just getting started. Live pictures from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Let's take a look at stock. We have gone positive on the indices. Let's bring in the CEO of Moderna, Starbucks CEO. UPS CEO. Senator Sherrod Brown. I always look forward to doing this interview. You've probably seen the headlines before. I want to get to some breaking news. Robinhood filed confidentially to go public. Elon tweeting Tesla. Suspended vehicle purchases using Bitcoin. We are going to take the lead on engineering a more accountable experience. Keep watching what happens on Yahoo Finance Live. Welcome back to Pride Evolution. I'm Kelly Matusik. An important part of being seen and heard is having political and corporate representation. Over the last decade and a half, hundreds of major businesses have adopted policies, benefits, and practices aimed at furthering the inclusion of the LGBTQ community. And since June of 2019, we have seen a 21% increase in LGBTQ political representation. To talk more on this, I'm joined by the Executive Director of the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, Andy Mara, President of the Human Rights Campaign, Alfonso David, and President and CEO of GLAD, Sarah Kate Ellis. Andy, according to the Trevor Project, 94% of LGBTQ plus youth say that recent politics have negatively impacted their mental health. In an era where LGBTQ plus rights are often politicized, are you able to explain more on what's happening around the country right now and the effects that these new laws have on the transgender community? Absolutely. I think that this year in particular, there's been a widespread number of anti-trans bills in particular popping up in state legislatures across the country. Now, while many of these bills have largely focused on uh, criminalizing gendering affirming care, for trans young people or banning trans young people from participating in sports. We've seen a lot of these bills um, actually die in committee or not be introduced to the floor. For the few that have, we've seen a robust response from a number of our organizations. Um, I know HRC uh, just recently announced a lawsuit in Florida challenging uh, the, the sports ban, the trans sports ban um, that was signed into law by Governor DeSantis. But I think what's also just as important to note, despite the increase, uh, the record-breaking number of anti-trans bills popping up in state legislatures across the country, we've also seen, as you, as you mentioned earlier, a record number of LGBTQ plus people running for office and winning. Um, and that's especially true for trans people across this country. Uh, we now have uh, close to 30 elected officials who are openly trans and serving their local communities, whether it's their city council, uh, like Rosemary Ketchum in Wheeling, West Virginia, or their state legislatures, like Stephanie Byers, an indigenous trans woman who serves in Kansas uh, State House of Representatives. Uh, the point being is that we're seeing an increased amount of visibility, and with that visibility means that we actually have a seat at the table and are able to speak to the lived experiences, the real experiences um, behind the dangerous and harmful uh, aspects of, this, of these kinds of bills. And sometimes having a seat at the table is half the battle. Alfonso, President Biden has urged Congress to pass the Equality Act, but we are still waiting on this landmark piece of legislation to be passed. Can you explain what the Equality Act will do and how it affects LGBTQ plus individuals? Sure. So the Equality Act would provide comprehensive legal protections for LGBTQ people. It would also provide protections for women as well as people of color. In, in the United States today, 29 states do not have comprehensive legal protections for LGBTQ people. So what does that mean? That means that you could face discrimination at a retail store, you could face discrimination at a transportation hub, you could face discrimination serving on a jury. We don't have those protections currently under federal law. President Biden signed an executive order instructing federal agencies to enforce the Bostock support Supreme Court decision, which is great. But unfortunately, we have areas of federal law 
where we don't have protections. So I could go out to buy a brand new shirt in a retail store and I could face discrimination as a black man or as a gay man and I would have no protections under federal law. The Equality Act would change that. And we need all of our allies and our advocates to engage with their senators to make sure they understand the importance of this bill. Definitely. And Sarah Kate, in 2021, 233 of the Fortune 500 companies actively participated in the Corporate Equality Index, the national benchmarking tool tracking progress for LGBTQ plus employees. Are there real benefits to workplaces being more diverse and inclusive? And what advice would you give to those in positions of hiring or in positions of power who hear this and want to help make a change? Oh, there absolutely are. You need to be a company that is open to all these days because we see it in the research that's coming up. One in six 18 to 24 year olds identify as LGBT. And so if you're thinking about attracting the next consumer set or attracting your next employee base, you need to offer an open and welcoming environment. And that includes both internally getting your policy your HR policies in order setting the right culture that is accepting and open to all and then externally supporting the LGBTQ community both in opposing bad legislation in signing amicus briefs that support good legislation in speaking up and out for and in support of the Equality Act so all of these pieces are really really important in supporting the LGBTQ community but also we're an intersectional community so it's people of color it's women it's people with disabilities all of the people who are marginalized in our community in our our country, it's important that companies are open and welcoming and to use their power and their platform to advance acceptance and equality for the LGBTQ community. Agreed. And I want to thank you three for being here today. We've heard why representation and action have made a difference for LGBTQ plus equality, but the community continues to fall behind in areas of mental health, physical health and access to care. More on this when we come back. Yahoo Plus Tech is an all new way to set up, sync, support, and protect your eligible home tech, all under one simple plan. Cracks, spills, and mechanical failures? You're covered. For all your other tech issues, Asurian experts are here for you 24 7 to solve problems and help you do more with tech, like secure your home network, understand parental controls, or choose the right streaming device. We can even help you decide what to buy next based on your exact needs. With Yahoo Plus Tech, you can leave your tech troubles at the door. Welcome to A Time for Change. We invite you to join us each week to assess how to create sustainable change. If you believe the country is in the wrong direction, then your option is to vote for change. It's really about raising awareness for how important it is to have diversity and to have different voices in the room. We are literally rewriting the code. We just have to make our case, keep pushing. There's a lot of stories to be told. This is Yahoo Finance Plus. Trade like it's not your first rodeo. Dive deeper with advanced analytics. Trade smarter with in-depth research reports and unique data. Make confident moves and grab your portfolio by the horns with Yahoo Finance Plus. Live pictures from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Let's take a look at stocks. We have gone positive on the indices. Let's bring in the CEO of Moderna, Starbucks CEO. UPS CEO. Senator Sherrod Brown. I always look forward to doing this interview. You've probably seen the headlines before. I want to get to some breaking news. Robinhood filed confidentially to go public. Elon tweeting Tesla. Suspended vehicle purchases using Bitcoin. We are going to take the lead on engineering a more accountable experience. Keep watching what happens on Yahoo Finance Live. Hi, welcome back to Pride Evolution. I'm Kelly Matusik. Queer and trans people are everywhere, but the healthcare system is still catching up to them and their needs. Recently, legislation has been passed denying transgender youth from accessing gender affirming care. Yet simultaneously, President Biden's Department of Health and Human Services says it will support the rights and healthcare protections for LGBTQ plus Americans. 
Joining us to discuss further is the president of GLAMA Health Professionals Advancing LGBTQ Equality, Dr. Scott Nass, and psychotherapist Omar Torres. Thank you for being here. So Dr. Nass, according to the Human Rights Campaign, at least 35 bills have been put forward in 2021 to prevent trans youth from gender affirming care. In your experience, have you seen this care be beneficial to transgender youth? And what does health equity look like to you? Yeah, that's a really challenging question right now, Kelly. Um, transgender youth really benefit from gender affirming care. We've known this for years and years. We've seen really good evidence that shows that youth who are acknowledged for who they are have lower rates of suicide attempts and thoughts. Uh, that they have better health health outcomes in the long run and, and grow into healthy, uh, productive adults. And so really seeing this legislation around the country has been incredibly disheartening because I have seen firsthand in my own practice uh, so many individuals who benefited from this care, being able to access comprehensive care teams with primary care providers, uh, including hormone specialists, um, behavioral health uh, counselors and specialists, and really just having access to, to care that helps them live authentically. And that's so important. And that really gets to the root of what health equity is for us to all live healthy, long lives uh, as we as we are uh, be, being healthy and just being supported along the way. And I think it's really disheartening again to see so much legislation around the country really trying to get in the way of the provider uh, patient relationship and really interfere with the, the maturing of naturally of these young adults. Definitely. And Omar, as a psychotherapist, you see a diverse spectrum of experiences. The Trevor Project conducted a survey stating in the last 12 months, 42% of LGBTQ plus respondents seriously considered attempting suicide and nearly half of LGBTQ plus youth reported wanting mental health care, but weren't able to get it. However, transgender and non-binary youth who reported having pronouns respected by all of the people they lived with attempted suicide at half of the rate of those who did not. I mean, the statistics are mind-blowing um, and, and they hurt to, to read these, but um, what types of issues or gaps are present for the LGBTQ plus community when attempting to receive or access mental health services? Yeah, I mean, I think the statistics kind of speak for themselves, right? Like finding gender affirming care um, is one of those things that cause gaps, um, as well as the history with the way the mental health world has treated queer people and trans people. So, you know, our relationship is a little bit fraught, right? Because we used to stigmatize and pathologize what we see now as being totally healthy. Um, and the lack of that repair and sort of the distrust in the mental health community from queer people is kind of like what gets in the way of repairing that relationship and filling those gaps. Yeah. And Omar, coming out is rarely easy and coming out to your doctor or therapist can come with its own unique challenges. What would you tell an LGBTQ plus person who is worried about coming out to their doctor or their therapist? That's a really good question question. And one of the things that I would sort of recommend is if you have a community of folks uh, that are queer to sort of go by word of mouth uh, and to try that first. So if you have a really good friend who loves their doctor and who has really good experiences with them to, you know, feel free to sort of like follow suit and connect to that doctor as well. And there are also tons of resources out there that offer um, you know, sort of like uh, lists of doctors um, and mental health providers that are gender affirming and queer friendly and also culturally sensitive and confident. And and to find those, you need the doctors that know what they're doing as well. Dr. Nass, do you have any tips for healthcare professionals out there who want to educate themselves better on the community's issues? Yeah, I think it's really important, number one, to just be open and uh, willing to learn about uh, patients who might be different than you or, or who might be living different experiences than what you're accustomed to. And there are so many resources out there now. There are, people are really craving knowledge around LGBTQ health, especially since most medical schools and other health profession schools aren't really teaching this in the curriculum still. We've seen you know, really frightening evidence from a few years ago that less than five hours on average were included in medical school curricula around LGBTQ health issues. And 
anecdotally, a lot of that was around HIV um, and just happened to also include someone um, of the LGBTQ spectrum. Um, so we've really seen a lot of organizations like LAMA and others out there uh, creating CME to really reach out to indiv um, continuing education opportunities to really reach out to uh, individuals who want to learn more about providing affirming care. But I think step one is just being open to learning and especially learning from patients and clients and hearing their stories and getting to understand that what they're going through really does matter overall to their care and really getting to know them as a whole person. Definitely. And I know we kind of touched on this, but do you have any resources for people out there who want to know where they can start when looking for help? Are there any websites or, or places to go to? Well, Glama has a great website where we uh, have some continuing education posted, including information about our annual conference and also a provider directory where you can find an affirming healthcare provider, whether it's a physician uh, in primary care or a subspecialty or someone in mental health. So that's glma.org. Um, and I think that's a great place for folks to start. And Omar, um, do you have any as well? That would be really helpful. Yeah, I mean, something as simple and well-known as psychology today could be a really good place to start. Um, a lot of therapists on there will list their specialty and populations that they've worked with or that they have experience with. And so you will often see therapists put things like, you know, specializes in LGBTQIA plus issues or have, you know, experience working with LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, and, you know, feel free whenever you reach out to a therapist to sort of like feel them out and ask them about their experience working with queer people. Uh, many, many therapists offer free like phone consultations where you can get a feel for them, where you can ask them questions. Um, and I think that's like a really good way of feeling a sense of like agency and autonomy over your own health. This information is so, so important. I appreciate you both coming here today. And coming up, we'll get into the implications of denying transgender and non-binary youth from playing school sports. But we will also meet a few individuals who have defied the odds and have inspired athletes around the world. Yahoo and Made of Millions invite you to open up. Take a snapshot that fits your mood. Choose your filter. Whatever you're feeling in this moment. Leave a personal message. And watch your story take shape in an AR mosaic that connects you to a community of allies. Let's stand up for mental health. Share your state of mind at openuptogether.com. You might have noticed a little bit of a different lineup. This is a new combination for us and a new time. This week, we're going to be kicking off some changes in our programming. We're in a critical period right now with record cases. We want public health measures to be the gateway to safely and prudently opening up the economy again. My advice to any entrepreneur out there is you got to pivot. Man. In this land of opportunity, anything is possible. It all comes down to business economics and safety. We can do this. I'm absolutely convinced. I can save today, but you can save the world. One day, you will become all that you dream of and more. And everything will be different. This world is not ready for all that you will do. The world needs you. Wonder Woman 1984. Rent or own the latest movies with Verizon Fios On Demand. What are you doing? Is it obvious? No. We're delivering live market coverage and offering expert analysis completely free. We're helping you make sense of the markets from anywhere you are. Uh, I get that, but uh, what are you doing here? Nice pajamas. Really? I say pajamas. Oh, pajamas, pajamas, whichever. Okay. Yahoo Finance. Watch today on Channel 604. Welcome to the show. Let's make finance make sense. Hi everyone, welcome back to Pride Evolution. I'm Kelly Matusik. Joining us now are four individuals who use their voice to further LGBTQ plus equality in sports. We're joined by Director of Policy and Reform for Athlete Ally, Ann Lieberman, six-time Team USA triathlete and founder of transathlete.com, Chris Mosier, Olympian advocate and author, Adam Rapon, and former WWE wrestler, Gabby Tuft. Hi. So the thing on top of many minds right now are the bills that are preventing transgender youth from participating in sports. 
Even though the Biden administration and the NCAA support transgender athletes, Caitlyn Jenner, among others, have said that they object to trans girls competing in sports because of fairness. And you work to make athletic institutions more inclusive and welcoming to LGBTQ plus individuals. Can you further explain the reasoning behind these new laws and how this ultimately affects trans and non-binary kids? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I just, just want to say that this has been the worst legislative session in history for LGBTQI plus Americans. We're looking at over 300 bills targeting LGBTQI plus people, and a third of those have been targeting trans youth. And when we look at these bills, this is really just the conversation we had in 2015, 2016 about bathrooms all over again, but in a different form, and that is the sports field. And the conversation is really predicated in this idea that trans people, that we don't belong in public space, that we are people to be to be feared. And when we look at the way in which the political situation has been targeting kids specifically, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Nine states in this country have passed bills to ban youth from playing sports with their friends. And, and Chris, you were impacted by regulations that could have prevented you from ever being on Team USA, but you also ended up being a catalyst for change. How did you persevere and what would you tell the kids who are currently being impacted by these new laws? It was certainly a challenge when I was first coming out, first looking at participating in sports and being my authentic self because I didn't see an example for myself. I didn't see if it could be done and I didn't see policies at that time that said that I was uh, not only allowed to participate but welcomed in sports. And what I would say to anybody today is just because it hasn't been done yet doesn't mean it can't be done. I think the way that I was able to persevere was that I just had a deep desire and uh, I was just completely unwilling to give up what I loved and have to negotiate whether or not I could be myself and continue to play those sports uh, because sports were so foundational to who I am, to how I see myself as a person, how I relate to other people. And we know that sports has that power. No individual should have to choose between being their authentic self and pursuing their passions and doing what they love. Yeah, I mean, and we've also seen the benefits that sports bring, you know, leadership, team management. I mean, the list goes on. So sports are so important. Um, Gabby, you've spoken openly on how you feel about the bans on transgender kids in sports, calling on our politicians to, quote, do their job and take unbiased, fair action. Can you explain more on what you mean by that and what this looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So what we're seeing is like a trickle down. We're seeing the media calling out or the politicians using the media to call out professional athletes that are transgender and taking these onesie twosie cases and using the term safety. And everybody always brings up like MMA and Fallon Fox with her, the broken orbital. It, it's so funny because that whole situation, broken orbitals are like the most common injury in MMA. There are several instances of this where it's cis female on cis female in UFC several times, even in 2019 where broken orbitals happened. So that's trickling down into where our children play. And it's so important to remember that children are children and that sports are around so that they can integrate socially. And it just, it really tears me apart to think that at such a young age, at the elementary school level, the junior high level, that we are teaching segregation, which, I mean, let's call it what it is. It is segregation. We are teaching other children that transgender children are different than them, when in fact, they need to integrate, they need to play normally, they need to feel accepted. And so if we can learn to move away from that, if we can call on our politicians to make the right choice which is not to ban our youth from playing together, this world is gonna be a much better place. Agreed, and Adam, today we're seeing so many examples of athletes who are out and they're proud and they're examples to other kids or adults who also wanna be athletes. On the theme of pride evolution, have you been able to see that professional sports have generally evolved to be more inclusive and what impact have you seen your own story have on other athletes? Well, I think that um, in the last few years since my own Olympic experience, I've seen more athletes within my own sport come out and share their stories. 
Um, and it's been really inspiring because I think, you know, maybe a few years before my Olympic experience, that was something that I never really thought that I would see. Uh, to see that there are so many people really em embracing that and embracing their true identity is is in incredible. Um, but, you know, to like everyone else was saying, I think, you know, sports has given me so much. And I think that um, we owe it to everyone to have those same opportunities. And I think people, you know, cis people within the LGBTQ plus community should really be a voice for those transgender kids. Because I think, you know, uh, these bills are coming out of a place of fear. Um, and I think there's a lot of misinformation. Um, and, you know, there there are so many incredible trans athletes out there um, at the Olympics this um, this summer in Tokyo. Uh, there'll be a woman named Laura Hubbard. She's from New Zealand. She's a weightlifter. Um, and, you know, she's going to be competing as an out trans woman. And I think that to see this representation is going to mean a lot to a lot of kids. And I think it's it's really important to see because I think when we see anybody succeed within the LGBTQ plus community, it inspires all of us to really embrace who we are and stand up for, you know, other people within the community too. Yeah, it's so important yeah. to see it to be it, you know, like that's, it's, it's cliche, but it's true. Um, and when we come back, Adam, you'll be sticking around and joined by Jazz Jennings, as well as your mothers, who will give us all, all parents out there, a few words of wisdom for raising an LGBTQ plus child. Yahoo Plus Tech is an all new way to set up, sync, support, and protect your eligible home tech, all under one simple plan. Cracks, spills, and mechanical failures? You're covered. For all your other tech issues, Asurian experts are here for you 24 7 to solve problems and help you do more with tech, like secure your home network, understand parental controls, or choose the right streaming device. We can even help you decide what to buy next based on your exact needs. With Yahoo Plus Tech, you can leave your tech troubles at the door. This is Yahoo Finance Plus. Trade like it's not your first rodeo. Dive deeper with advanced analytics. Trade smarter with in-depth research reports and unique data. Make confident moves and grab your portfolio by the horns with Yahoo Finance Plus. We're here in Jackson Hole sitting down with Kansas City Fed President Esther George. So I think the Federal Reserve's commitment has been to being as transparent as they can. The low inflation is a real challenge for us in, as central bankers. It shows that we're data dependent and shows that we're sensitive to what's going on in the, in the macroeconomic environment. We certainly should be able to communicate uh, what our policy is. Welcome to A Time for Change. We invite you to join us each week to assess how to create sustainable change. If you believe the country is in the wrong direction, then your option is to vote for change. It's really about raising awareness for how important it is to have diversity and to have different voices in the room. We are literally rewriting the code. We just have to make our case, keep pushing. There's a lot of stories to be told. Welcome back to Pride Evolution. I'm Kelly Matusik. As we've been discussing, acceptance is vital and increasing. According to the Trevor Project, 86% of LGBTQ plus youth report having high levels of support from at least one person in their lives. And family acceptance continues to make a life-saving difference. To talk more on this, we're joined by LGBTQ activist, author, and television personality, Jazz Jennings, and her mother, Jeanette, as well as Olympian advocate and author, Adam Rapon, and his mother, Kelly. Adam, when you came out to your fairly large family, you were accepted with open arms. Between all of the anxiety and nervousness that culminates when someone's about to come out, did this family acceptance make a difference in your life? And can you describe your experience? You know, the, the family acceptance made a huge difference in my experience. It was something that I know that a lot of LGBTQ plus people aren't afforded is to have that large amount of support from their family. Um, and, you know, in the vein of being dramatic, I told each of my five siblings separately. So I came out many times when I was home. 
Um, <laughs> but it was great because I felt like embraced. I felt like nothing had changed with my relationship with anyone in my family. Um, but you know, even if I was scared, you know, there were people who had come before me who I had I had heard their stories and heard, you know, of their their families accepting them and loving them all the same. Um, you know, I, I'm really honored to be on this call with Jazz because I remember Jazz's story. And um, it was something that I like looked to uh, when I was coming out. So it was uh, it was really inspiring to me and it, it, meant, it meant a lot to me. And Kelly, you've recently published a book on the importance of being a supportive and positive parent. When Adam came out to you, you said you already knew, you know, that mother's intuition. Um, but what would you tell a parent who maybe feels blindsided after learning their child is LGBTQ plus or isn't sure how to respond at the moment? I think the the probably the best advice, if I was going to be bold enough to give advice, is to um, say nothing, like to listen, listen at more than speak, uh, because it's difficult for your child to share personal intimate details of um, elements of their being that they, they just haven't shared publicly yet and they're trusting you. So the best thing someone can do without regret is to listen. Agreed. And I think we could all take a, a note from that um, listening half the time. I feel like a lot of times we just want to talk and talk, but sometimes listening is the exact thing that we need to be doing. And Jazz, you were one of the youngest publicly documented people to be identified as transgender at the age of five. And from day one, we've seen that your parents have encouraged you on your journey. What have been some of the most impactful moments to you where your parents have shown you their support? Um, one memory that I have specifically was my fifth birthday party. My parents allowed me to wear this sparkly rainbow bathing suit for my fifth birthday party in front of all my friends who were going to be there from school. Um, you're shaking your head? No, I'm smiling. Oh, I, I remember. It was such a great day. <laughs> they were so great to me, allowing me to just like express myself and wear this bathing suit that I love so much. And I just was able to be happy and be my true authentic self. And it was just such a memorable moment. Yeah, I'm sure. And that was one of the earliest, I'm sure, memories as well. Um, where else have you found that acceptance and belonging? I'm sure, you know, social media or, or your friends. Um, one of the biggest moments that my parents have been supportive with me was when it came to me being banned from playing girls soccer. Um, I was told at age eight that I had a competitive advantage being born biologically male um and i was banned from playing on my girls travel soccer team and instead of just quitting and just saying okay i'm not gonna play soccer anymore my parents put up a fight with the florida youth soccer association and after a two-year-long battle they passed a policy with the united states soccer federation that allows all transgender youth soccer players to play soccer so they they did something amazing for me they supported me legally and allowed me to play the sport that i wanted to play and that i was so passionate about um and yeah they were just looking out for my happiness and for my sake Jeanette I mean you've you've always been there uh, we've been able to see that through tv but um have you found yourself having to become a teacher or an educator for other people since jazz came out as trans uh yeah since day one I feel like We've been educating um, from the moment we went on TV the first time with Barbara Walters. That was the reason we went on, was to share our story with other people, to have them see that transgender children do exist, and we need to listen to them and follow their lead and love them with all our hearts because they already have a tough road ahead. You know, they face uh, bullying and discrimination. And I've had to tell parents along the way and teach them, you know, parent the child that you have, not the child that you wish you had. And that's really important mm -hmm. to know that the kids are more important. It's their birthright to be loved and to be happy and check your ego at the door and take care of them because that's your job as a parent. She's a great mama bear. Uh. <laughs> Kelly, have you encountered parents who don't have a willingness to understand uh, either? And, and how have you responded to that? Well, sometimes I do. Uh, you know, sometimes I take it, you know, an opportunity for a teaching moment when somebody will say, um, you know, I'm just praying that Adam finds the right girl. And I will say, you know, pray for world peace or pray for something that <laughs> that will help the world because, you know, um, He's got this covered, you know, uh, but for the most part, I think things have changed. There's been so many people that have 
stepped up, used their platforms, um, shared their personal stories and shared a piece of their their soul with us, like Jazz, like Adam, like so many others. And they're not just doing the community a favor and um, giving they're giving allies a privilege because when somebody comes out, they give us um, permission to disclose. So when people are sharing personal details like that, it's it empowers allies not only to know more, but to connect with that empathy. Definitely, and connection's so key. And Adam, what, what were one of the hardest parts about coming out when you, when you, I knew you had support from your family, but do you think that there were any difficult parts from that? Um, there were some difficult parts. Um, I, and one thing, nobody's praying for me to find the right girl anymore, I think. And if they are, <laughs> they really should pray for something. Um, but, you know, I think that the, the most difficult things that I encountered were, were within the sports world. Um, you know, I'm as a figure skater, I think that there's this preconceived notion that, like, you know, it's a more artistic sport so that you might be gay. Um, and there's sometimes it felt like growing up that there was this huge pushback that um, because I was gay, I was exactly the stereotype. Um, and I was exactly what they kind of didn't want there. And that's what I felt, whether I was told that outright, I, you know, I, it was just something I always felt. I was always told to kind of like butch it up and, and, um, you know, don't skate like a girl, um, whatever that means, you know, cause like good skating is good skating. Being a good athlete is being a good athlete. Um, and I think that the thing mm -hmm. that, um, that I really encountered and the, where my fear came from was that I would be judged differently. Um, you know, it's a judged sport or that I would look um, looked at and, and, and maybe not have the same opportunities that, that, uh, cis straight person would have in my sport. But at the end of the day, I really thought that like, if I can't do this as my authentic self, and if being open and gay in my sport is something that's going to limit my opportunities, then it doesn't really matter because then if I can't be myself, then it's really not that it's not worth it because I got so much more joy out of just, you know, competing as my authentic self. And, you know, when you're going and you're representing your country, if you can't represent yourself to the best of your ability, then you're not representing your country to the best of your ability. So I, I always yeah. focused on like, it was so much more important to me um, to be an out athlete. And Jazz and Jeanette, representation is so important. Do you think acceptance is easier now since there are so many more LGBTQ plus characters on TV? I think with increased visibility, there is greater acceptance. I think there's a lot more people out there saying, okay, I can identify with that character, with that person. I'm just like them. And they're able to, you know, find their true self through that process of seeing someone just like them. And they no longer feel alone and isolated in who they are. So it really does make a difference to see that representation. And Adam and Jazz, if you could say your mom has taught you one thing that has stuck with you throughout your whole life, what would that be? Mm. Maybe two things. <laughs> my mom's told me a lot oh, of things that have stuck with me my whole life. But Jazz, you please, you go first, please. All right. Age? It's just for me, it's, the main thing is it's all about unconditional love. Those are her big two words, unconditional love, loving your child unconditionally, loving yourself unconditionally, loving all other people unconditionally, just being who you are, loving that person, and then sharing that love with everyone else. And I, I think for me, one of the biggest things that my mom um, taught me was that like, if I'm going to do something, I have to give it 100%. And um, I took that yeah. and I like use that in every single thing I do. And um, as I got older, I realized that to give something 100%, you have to give all of yourself. And sometimes that means, you know, sharing all of yourself with whatever you're doing and, and whomever you're working with. And so um, it's been such an important lesson and something I bring with me. And it's something that like, you know, when whatever I'm doing, whether it's in the sports world or, or not, um, you know, I really give 100% of, of myself and um, I try to use my voice whenever I have the opportunity to. That was another thing my mom taught me, always to like use my voice. Jeanette Kelly, did they get that right? I would say um, that definitely 
um, she hit the um, nail on the head. Did I say that right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've always, our whole family is about unconditional love. And uh, for other people as well, it teaches us to accept those that we don't know. And everybody is the same. We're all human beings. We all need to be treated equally. And I've instilled that in all my children um, to be kind, to be nice, to be yeah. good people. And, you know, she taught me the meaning of unconditional love by being her parent. Mm. I am a better person. Okay. Mm. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Hey, we're so lovey. Yeah, we really are. I want to thank you all for joining us today for this Yahoo special presentation of Pride Evolution. Everyone involved in this panel is working to make the lives of LGBTQ plus folks better, using their platforms to amplify our voices and helping us to create an environment of understanding and love. And that's what we will continue to do here at Yahoo, building a future where everyone can be uplifted and recognized for who they are. Thank you for joining us and happy Pride.